I'm Stephanie Skinner from Culture Media. And once again, we are here to talk about cheese. Uh, today, we are going to be meeting with uh, Bob Wills. And before that, Molly Brown is going to give us uh, the lay of the land on what's happening in Wisconsin. But one brief comment about Bob. Some people make great cheese. Uh, Bob not only makes great cheese, he also helps to make some great cheese makers. So with that said, I'm handing it over to Molly. Awesome. Hello, everybody. I can see folks are still filtering in here, um, and I'm so pleased to see so many familiar names um, appearing in my attendee list here. So I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us here today. Um, I'm Molly Brown, the Education Manager for the Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin. Um, and, uh, you know, just to tell you a little bit about our organization, um, we are um, actually funded um, through the Dairy Checkoff Program, which uh, establishes a marketing fund uh, for um, Wisconsin made dairy products um, through the sales of fluid milk in our state. So Wisconsin is a really in a unique position as a dairy producing state. Um, we actually 90% um, of the fluid milk made in our state is actually uh, made into cheese. So um, as far as our marketing efforts go, we have a unique opportunity to really focus um, on the marketing of artisan and specialty cheeses, which is very exciting um, for me in particular, since I'm a total cheese head, as I'm sure all the rest of you here today are. Um, so Wisconsin truly is the state of cheese. Um, we are the only state that requires a cheesemaker uh, to hold a license um, to make cheese. Um, and we have more than 1,200 licensed cheesemakers in our state. Um, we're also home to the only master cheesemaker program outside of Europe. Uh, and we have, a, a, I believe, 90 master cheesemakers in our state, um, one of whom is joining us here today. Um, so Bob Wills is joining us from Cedar Grove and Clock Shadow Creamery, along with his son, Bo. And they're going to tell you guys a little bit about um, their, uh, their company, companies, um, and all the great work that they do here in our state. Um, as Stephanie alluded to, Bob definitely has quite a legacy here in the Wisconsin cheese industry. He has not only created two of his own um, wonderful, unique cheese brands, but also been an instrumental part of launching um, other cheesemakers and other cheese brands here in our state. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to those guys. I hope you guys enjoy. Well, thanks for inviting us today and thanks to all of you who are joining us. Um, I wanna, I'm gonna share um, some memories. Uh, Bo's gonna share some, some memories um, Bo, Bo basically grew up in the business. Um, so he was uh, um, born in the house across the street from Cedar Grove Cheese out in Plain. And um, before, before I bought the factory, it belonged to his grandfather. And so it's been a, a, a pretty much uh, all consuming for his life, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, drop in a few slides just to give you a, a sense of what we do. And then, um, and then we're gonna try some cheeses and talk about those. Let's see, we ended up with the wrong, there we go. All right, so, so our, our cheese factory um, in Plain is one of the uh, oldest cheese factories in the state of Wisconsin. Um, this, uh, this is a picture of it that kind of, to me, captures the way its history is in the mist. Um, it, it makes the factory look considerably smaller than it, than it is, but the, the building, um, Underneath there was built in 1900 and the cheese factory itself started in 1878. And uh, among, the, among the things we do there are uh, a lot of cheese curds. So in summer months, we make about 26,000 pounds a week of white and yellow cheddar cheese curds. And we, um, and we distribute those primarily in the Midwest because we have a, 
we have a belief that cheese curds are only cheese curds for a few days. And um, that if you bag them up and vacuum seal them or gas flush them and put them on the shelves for uh, a month or three months, um, that they're really sort of inferior pieces of mild or medium cheddar by the time they're done. So cheese curd ought to be squeaky and all of the cheese curds we make for the most part um, leave our plant the same day that they're made. So we start making cheese typically around 10 o'clock in the evening and by um, eight o'clock in the morning we have trucks pulling away from the dock loaded with fresh curds. Um, besides cheese curds, we do a really wide variety of um, products. This is a, a natural rind um, cheddar flat that's um, in the wheel. It's a, about a 40 pound piece of cheese and, and we let the natural rind develop on it. It's a fantastic piece of cheese. I love it. Um, we, uh, we, we have the advantage of being in Wisconsin of getting a lot of training opportunities through the Center for Dairy Research. And um, one, one, of the, one of the classes that I took down there, they were talking about a Brazilian cheese called queso quajo or some, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that quite right. So we changed it to cheesy Q. And it's a cheese that um, traditionally is put on a skewer and dropped on a, um, on a hibachi on, and served on the beaches in, in Brazil. And, but when I heard about it, I thought this is the most Wisconsin thing I've ever heard of, that you could take cheese and put it on the barbecue. And um, so we, we make uh, vegetarian um, hot dogs basically out of the, um, out of the cheesy queue and also um, we got the, the bratwurst flavoring recipe from Straka Meats, which is a local meat company in, in Plain, Wisconsin. And they, uh, they revealed their secrets to us and we made a bratwurst flavored um, cheesy Q. And I submitted that to the last uh, American Cheese Society cheese contest. Got the first perfect score I've ever received on a cheese. So that was um, pretty rewarding. Cedar Grove Cheese was the first um, cheese company in the country um, to decide not to accept milk from cows that have been treated with bovine growth hormone. And so all of the cheeses we make are made without genetically modified products. The, uh, the, so our whole, our whole brand line is RBGH free. And as you'll see in the next slide, um, the labeling for being RBGH free was a kind of complicated issue in the early days, especially, but Wisconsin has its own um, requirements for, for labeling. So one of the things we decided was uh, an advantage uh, or easier to do was for us to pursue the organic line. And today about two thirds of the cheese that we make in or at least 60% of the cheese we make in Cedar, at Cedar Grove cheese is organic certified cheese. And uh, there's a, a variety of different flavored um, our, um, cheeses in the RBGH free line. So um, quite a few years ago, we started working with, with goat and sheep milk producers and some of the cheeses that we're gonna be trying today are um, cheeses, mixed milk cheeses. So the, the Caprico, which we'll be looking at is a, um, a, a goat and cow milk blend. And um, the Cerberus, which also was an award winner at the last ECS contest was a uh, three milk sheep, goat and cow milk. And then, uh, and then we smoked it. So it has, if anything, too much going on. The sheep milk cheese line also includes um, Fleance, Montague, and Donatello. And you'll notice in some of our, um, some of the cheeses that we are making, the, uh, um, 
the cheese comes, has names that are connected to Shakespeare. And um, Bo and his sister, when they were about six and four years old, had the opportunity to play the Macduff children in a Shakespeare production at, of Macbeth at American Players Theater, which is about seven miles down the road from us in Spring Green, Wisconsin. And I, um, I, I not only um, got to enjoy watching them get killed week, week after week in the, in the, throughout the summer, um, but- I'm not sure how much we sold it because I think the audience laughed uh, <laughs> instead of being horrified when the children got killed a lot of the time, but- Which is good. Yeah. Um, but, but I also um, became a, a big fan of um, the Shakespearean plays and found that, that they often captured what we were trying to do with our cheeses. So my favorite cheese, which unfortunately we haven't been able to make recently because no one will milk them, was a cheese made out of water buffalo milk, um, a blend of cow milk and water buffalo milk that we called Weird Sisters and named after the, um, the witches in Macbeth. And those, um, that, that cheese um, not only captured the, the, um, the lovely uh, earthy flavor of the water buffalo milk and the, and the creaminess, but also um, was a, you know, was named aptly because the water buffalo and the cows looked like they were kind of weird sisters, like they were, like there was a bizarro version of a cow there. And, um, and we found also that it sold really well because almost everybody who came in the plant said that they had a weird sister or someone who they, or some close friend who they considered a weird sister. Um, unfortunately, the water buffalo were um, big and a little- um, Aggressive. Yeah, a little difficult to deal with and the, and the people who've, who own the water buffalo are no longer willing to milk them. Uh, this is just an artsy picture, probably taken by people from Milk Marketing Board, of the uh, of some of the Montague and as it's aging in wheels. And this is um, the, our quark, which we're also going to try today. So the quark is a um, German-style cream cheese. When and so when we opened our cheese factory in Milwaukee um, at Clock Shadow Creamery about almost 10 years ago now, um, part of the objective there was to get as close as we could to our consumers and to the local chefs. We felt like moving out and playing, <clears throat> and playing the, um, we were a bit isolated that, that on a busy day out there, we do about as much business as we can do in an hour in Milwaukee. And, the, uh, and so we didn't, weren't getting the feedback that we wanted from consumers. So we opened a small cheese factory in one of the poorer areas to the, of the city with an objective to help with the, with the local development here and also to be able to, to have more interaction with our consumers and with our customers. And since then, we have had a lot of um, chefs from the area who've come into the factory and asked us to make specialty cheeses just for them. We are also able to use it as a training facility. So this picture is a picture of people um, coming in, I think probably um, possibly during the uh, World um, Cheese uh, Expo put on by the Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association. But we bring in um, groups of cheesemakers and sometimes groups of chefs and we allow them to um, help us with experimental vats of cheese and developing new varieties and all of us learn together about how to make different types of cheese. So this was a sheep milk cheese that we were making. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, some of the partnerships that we do. And to do that, I'm gonna exit the, uh, 
and then exit the slideshow for a bit. Hey, Bob. Yeah. This is, this is Stephanie. Yeah. I have a question that uh, while you're futzing with your computer, um, someone wants to know if R RBGH is a concern in Wisconsin, cheeses from other regions don't label for this and, and whoever it is, it's not sure if this is a unique worry for Wisconsin or others place, other places that are not disclosing this information. Well, so I, th I think it, um, I think it's an, it, it was initially a concern for people with fluid milk and, it, and in, at least in this region of the country and maybe wider area, um, there's almost no milk that was being sold that was produced from cows that were being treated with the, with the growth hormone. Um, once the, uh, once that, that took place, then people began to focus more on other dairy products. And our concern has not been Although there have been people with some health concerns, our concern has not been primarily with um, what the health impacts of having the growth, the additional growth hormones in there is, as much, much as it's been a matter of um, supporting our dairy farmers by um, not adding to a surplus of, of milk in the marketplace. And, um, being responsive to the consumers who have expressed expressed a desire to, to not have additional have the the cows treated with hormones. Um, there are also you know there's been expressed some concerns about health impacts on on the animals as well that the additional milk production is stressful. But our general attitude at the cheese factory has been that. Um, you know, when, when the RBTH free thing first started, we looked at a lot of the science at, of, of the composition of the milk. And while, the, while Monsanto at the time was arguing that there was no significant difference between milk that had been, that came from a cow that had been treated and a cow that produced at that same level without being treated, what we found was that the desirable um, elements of the milk were stronger in, in cows that produced less milk. And so it wasn't just a matter of, um, of pushing the, the production with an with a additional um, hormone, but it was also a matter of pushing the cows to produce uh, significantly higher levels of, of milk. And that the cows that were grazed and the cows that, that were um, the, the didn't, they weren't pushed as hard, um, seem to have more better characteristics, both for cheese production and probably for human health. So, so that's been our, that's been our perspective on it. And we've, um, and we've stuck with that over the years. Great. Thank you. So one of the things we, we've tried to do, and one of the things I think has been great about the cheese industry in general, and especially the Wisconsin cheese industry, is how cheesemakers um, tend to help each other out and all work together. Back probably 20 years ago now, we started an organization called the Wisconsin Specialty Cheesemakers Association. And at the time, um, uh, people like Paul Scharfman and Steve McKeon and um, folks from Maple Leaf and, and, and we, you know, got this organization started and there was a lot of skepticism in the beginning because there was a sense that people wouldn't really appreciate how much the um, the, the people wouldn't really share that, that much that we all had our own secrets and that we weren't going to tell each other the secrets. And what we found was, first of all, that we were all in a similar situation where partly because of the milk market orders, um, Wisconsin had been producing 
commodity products with high priced milk and we were losing market share all the time. And, um, and partly we had underestimated the, the lubricating value of beer. Um, and so as we got meeting and sitting around at the bar and talking, our, our initial plan had been that we would talk about ways to share promotional things that we would talk about sourcing for insurance, sourcing of trucking, sourcing of ingredients or packaging or, or whatever, um, things that a lot of us all, all had um, similar needs for. Um, but what we also found was that we were not as reluctant as people thought to share ideas because, um, because we, I think a lot of us realized that it's a really big market with a lot of really good opportunities and that there's always a new idea on the horizon. And so being defensive about our, about our ideas didn't really make a lot of sense. One of the things I, I, when I first bought the cheese factory back in 1989, we'd go up to the cheese, up to the um, church for um, fish fries on Friday nights. And you probably remember this, that we, we would walk into the church and it was everything was family style and we'd sit down at a, at a table and there'd be um, slices of cheese on a plate in the middle of the table. And one of the first things people would do is to take the cheese and tell you which factory in the neighborhood it came from. So, you know, it could come from Gruber's or it could come from Bear Valley or it could come from Cedar Grove cheese or from Suminix or um, at, at one point there were 27 factories within seven miles of, of where our plant is today, I think. So, but all of us were making um, cheddar and supplying medium cheddar to the, to the um, fish fry and yet um, the people in town always could identify which plant it came from because we weren't making the same cheese. And when you get into specialty cheeses that becomes even more true that, you, that the, the quark that I make is significantly different than the quark that would be made in Vermont or made in California. And, um, and so there's just a lot of good opportunities. So, so having had that experience with the, with the um, Specialty Cheesemakers Association, um, we started having people coming in and asking if they could share our facility and we, op and we just made that a thing. Um, so, so we let people, Willie Lehner from Bluemont Dairy would come in and make um, cheese curds when he's doing the farmer's market um, or we'll make uh, cheese that he's gonna age in his caves. Anna Landmark makes her sheep milk cheeses in our back room and, and has a split plant agreement with us. Ron Henningfeld is working here today at Clock Shadow uh, making cheese for Hill Valley Dairy. Ron had been our lead cheese maker here before he had children and then he decided to scale back and now is, um, is creating his own, his own market. Um, and other cheese makers uh, like, like um, Katie Hedrick and, um, and Fritz Thal, or Felix Thalhammer and, and some of the other pretty well-known specialty cheesemakers in the state have made cheese in our plant. Diana Murphy um, was probably our first intern who used our, her experience in our factory to um, get her cheese making license before she started a small sheep, um, on-farm sheep production operation. And then um, clearly the most famous or uh, most successful of the, of the um, internship kinds of situations was uh, Mike and Carol Gingrich with Pleasant Ridge Reserve. And uh, Mike came into the factory one day and um, he said, you know, he explained to me how he'd been grooming his herd to be to, for grazing and he'd been grooming his pastures and how he really wanted to make um, I, the way the way I recall he described it was that he wanted to make the best cheese in the world and he didn't care what it cost. And I think I responded, "Yeah, we can do that." Um, so with so with a lot of help from the Center for Dairy Research, 
and um, and meticulous note taking on Carol's part. And we uh, we made a, a whole bunch of small batches of cheese, which they initially took and aged in their basement until we came up with a formulation that we liked. And then we grew that up, um, got Mike enough experience to have his own uh, license and then eventually to um, start his own cheese factory, which Andy Hatch now is operating. Um, so anyway, that was, that was a lot of fun and, and it started a whole lot of other, um, a lot, whole lot of other cheesemakers and farmers in particular saying, hey, if you can do that for Mike, can you do that for us? And um, so, um, so, we, so we make, we also take milk from individual farms and create brands for them that they can go off and market on their own. So M McCluskey Brothers, Shillelagh Glen Farm, and um, Jim and Rebecca Goodman um, have have their cheeses made and then take it to the farmers market in Madison. Um, uh, Ron Milkhouse makes uh, has an A2 milk supply and he does marketing on A2 cheese. Um, we have a uh, number, well, oh, and Tom and Sally Murphy also have their milk turned into curds for the farmer's market. Um, we make a grass-based, 100% grass-based milk product for Prairie Pure out of Minnesota. Um, we have a, a, a couple Amish cooperatives that have us make their milk for them. And, um, and then we have uh, the um, Williams Family Farm and um, out of Waukesha that had us take a cheese that had been out of existence for about 30 years and make it and uh, called um, bone, breed. bone breed brick cheese. And uh, we worked with them and, and, uh, and have, have brought that back from the dead. And then we worked with um, John and Kim Kepke um, from the Economowoc area, which is another suburban Milwaukee operation. And we um, convert their, their milk into LaBelle cheese, um, which they market on their own, which is kind of a blend of a, um, a chowda and a um, Wutterkaser recipe that we made up um, based on their Dutch heritage. Um, so, hey Bob, while you're while you're transitioning, um, there's another question here that came in earlier. Do you offer whole wheels or loaves um, for stores that have cut and wrap programs? Yes, we do. There you go. Okay, that that's an easy answer. <laughs> Keep those easy <laughs> questions coming. <laughs> And there's a lot of love for the uh, for the Andy Hatch, or I should say, the Ple the Pleasant Ridge story. Thank you for that. The um, yeah, I, th I think we're I think it's time for us to head into talking about some cheese. Um, we sent sent out cheese to a lot of you, and um, and then I sent out a bunch of quasi insane pairing suggestions. Um, And I, I don't, I was trying to remember what order we're doing this all in. I'm gonna let Bo talk some about cheese. Um, well, first of all, do you got any stories from growing up in the cheese factory about your, your grandfather or anybody that you'd like to share with people? Because well, uh, you have up, a different perspective than I do. Yeah, growing up across the street from the cheese factory, I uh, worked about every job there is to work there. Um, I started out when I was very young, getting gift boxes together um, during Christmas holidays. Um, then I kind of moved into helping wrap the cheese, which I probably didn't help very much. I think I probably just slowed things down, but that's, uh, it was a good experience for me. Um, I also would uh, make forts in the cooler uh, with the 40 pound blocks, which I'm sure drove somebody nuts who had to organize all that. But, um, yeah, then uh, in, through high school, I moved into working in the cooler more with the organizational aspects and um, 
eventually made cheese as well. So uh, more on the administrative side of things these days, the business side, but uh, I have, have a lot of that background. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I remember the first time that I was making cheese and my grandpa would come in to buy cheese and give people um, quasi factual tours. Um, <laughs> and uh, I do remember uh, the first time I was making cheese and he was looking through the glass and he looked pretty, he looked pretty proud to see me in there. And that was, that was a good feeling. Um, I don't know, Grandpa Freddy's stories. I remember a uh, little old lady was buying a bag of garlic dill cheese curds and asked what the little green flecks were on the cheese curds. And uh, he said, oh, you don't know what that is? That's marijuana. <laughs> so he, he is definitely a, a joker, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's fun family business. Um, uh, Dad was kind of uh, hitting, hinting at the fact that we don't really consider cheese curds cheese curds after a few days and then I've been spoiled to the point where I, I don't think I would really be interested in eating cheese curds uh, more than a day old but probably more than an hour old yeah more than an hour <laughs> old yeah um, so yeah so so um, when, when Bo's talking about his grandfather and, and his his attitude toward tours he um, he I'd been, I, after I bought the cheese factory, um, Ferdy was still um, hanging around and he was doing most of the tours and stuff. And I was working out in the plant, learning my, learning my new profession. And he uh, came in one day and he said, oh, there's some people out here and they need a tour and you got to give it. And I'm like, uh, I don't know anything. All they've let me do so far is to wash the vats and, and dress, um, put the cloths in the hoops. And uh, he said, well, you, you know more than they do. Just, just make it up. <laughs> so um, I, I've tried not to do as much of that as he did, but it, it, it was pretty entertaining sometimes to listen to the Blarney that he came up with. Um, so the, uh, the first cheese we were starting with was um, the Butterkäse. And um, so Butterkäse is one of the, of the cheeses that um, I'm a, I've been certified as a Wisconsin Master Cheesemaker for. Uh, the Wisconsin Master Cheesemaker program is a fantastic opportunity for cheesemakers in our state. Um, it, it takes, after we, we can't, we can't get into it until we've had 10 years experience as a licensed cheesemaker. And then we have to choose um, up to two cheeses that we wish to be recognized as a master in. Then we take three years of classes and send our cheese in for evaluation. And, um, and they can pull the plug on us anytime they think that we're not up to their standards still. So that's always a bit scary, especially since we never seem to be having the right cheese at the right time for when they come to evaluation evaluation. Um, but the, uh, the, the Butterkäse is a great melting cheese. It, it makes um, really good macaroni and cheese. It makes really good grilled cheese sandwiches. Um, it, as I suggested, if you melt it over an apple pie, it's great. It has a generally a very strong buttery flavor and a, a little bit of a lemony kind of type, uh, note to it. Um, so Molly, are you eating that? Yes, I am. I was just typing a content uh, comment, um, but I paired this with a savory onion jam, um, which just really left me craving a grilled cheese. <laughs> but the two together on a grilled cheese would be fantastic. Um, but I like, this cheese is so interesting to me because um, it presents as so buttery and mild, but it really has like a subtle complexity to it um, mm -hmm. that I really appreciate. It's a little bit unexpected. And um, I love that little bit of like nuance that you get from it. <clears throat> it it's good with, so I'll, the trouble, the problem I have in a lot of these pairings is that um, so many of the things are good with the same things. So that you know, we we uh, talk later on about the um, the spring onion macaroni and cheese, 
which would probably be the next one that I would go to, um, the, the spring onion jack. And, um, and, and that also goes really well with uh, um, either macaroni and cheese or grilled cheese sandwiches or, um, or just to eat. Or just, um, you know. You know and it, and it's for, it, for this time of year, it's a really nice uh, reminder that we're starting to get into the into that time of year when we're getting the we're going to have the spring potatoes and onions and the and the spring the spring onion jack on top of a on top of a um, spring small spring potato will be a, a great dinner. But the um, the other thing that I was going to go back to is that the butter case is also really nice with some chocolates, especially a a dark chocolate. I find the creamier cheeses like the butter case or the, uh, we have a double cream Colby here that we didn't send out with this package, but uh, the really creamy uh, cheeses go very well as uh, salty sweet combinations. I like making uh, grilled cheese sandwiches out of the butter case uh, with, with jelly or something like that. After the um, onion jam, I put some, I tried some orange marmalade. I'm just pairing with whatever random things I found in my refrigerator today. It's, yeah. a, very, it's a very elevated way to pair. Um, and it's really awesome with the quince and apple orange marmalade. There's just like a little bit of the bitterness from the orange peel in there. Um, it's such a nice highlight to the cheese. Um, Carlos is asking about the, uh, the butter case too. And it's, a, well, I agree with this. It's a little bit more curdy than what he would normally um, think of as this style of cheese. And he just wants to have you talk a little bit more about the profile of that cheese. Well, I, I, I think the particular one that we sent out was probably um, probably a little on the curdy and a little on the younger side. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you can see, this This is a, a little bit more, this is not the Yeah. The, uh, the one I have here is a little bit more um, typical and it's, um, quite quite flexible and soft. Um, this one, however, happens to be about um, six months old right now. So um, we we ran out for a little while. So the one that we sent out was probably a month or two old. So anyway, yes, that I I think that it's atypical to be curdy. Mm. Flavor is probably similar, but the um, texture is probably more typically smooth and, smooth and creamy. Mm -hmm. Someone is also asking about uh, for you to talk more about the double cream Colby. Oh sure, that's an interesting one because it was. Uh, I mean, part of our advantage being here in Milwaukee, we're very small, and certain aspects of what we do are very inefficient. Um, but uh, we are, you know, a much tighter part of the community this way. And we had a uh, local artist, John Reipenhoff, um just come into our retail store one day and he said that as kind of an art project, um, he wanted to develop a, um, a higher fat content Colby. Um, I think he liked Colby because it's, uh, you know, named after the city in Wisconsin, very Wisconsin cheese. Um, are there any other details of the? Well, so, so he, he was going to art exhibits and in, in, in galleries and shows around the country in New York and in Chicago and some other places. And he felt like his artwork was representative of a community. And so he was taking a beer that he had made specially for him and, um, and this cheese that, that we developed at his request and using them as, as props at his art exhibit or his, or his shows. And um, so yeah, the, you know, we were basically just riffing off of how he makes his artwork, how I how I develop um, ch cheese variations, and basically, you know, I was both of us had the perspective that we take something familiar um, and then put a twist on it to make it interesting. And he he said, you know, like double cream Colby, and I went. Of course, double cream Colby. That seems like a perfect idea of what to do. So Which I, I think if you Google double cream Colby, I don't think that there's an, another one. <laughs> I think that would make the yeah. other one. And, and I'm not sure. It, I'm not sure it um, is uh, hits 
quite the definition of a double cream. It's enhanced cream, but it's, um, but it, I think there are some people have very strict rules on what make on double cream for, um, for things like brie. Um, this has as much cream as a Colby can handle <laughs> and, still, and still be recognizable as a Colby cheese. Um, there's actually a pretty good segue into the next section. The cork was also developed um, in collaboration with the uh, local German population mm -hmm. that, uh, that, well, cork is very famous in, in uh, Northern Europe and uh, they'll eat it, um, they'll eat it on bagels. Uh, they'll make um, crinkle, crinkle out of it. Uh, it's a really versatile cheese. It's good for baking. It's good for, um, you know, eating on bagels, that kind of thing. It goes, Yogurt. It goes really well, salty or sweet. Um, uh, he does literally everything with it. Um, some some less traditional things for, for certain. Well, yeah, peach pie with quark is yeah. really good. <laughs> um, um, but the traditional, uh, the, the most well-known is uh, Käsekuchen of the of German specialties. And you can find mixes for that, but basically it, it, it's a uh, cheese, cheesecake recipe um, where you take the cream cheese out and you substitute quark. And um, I usually put three, three parts of quark and one part of cream cheese because I use the recipe off of the cream cheese box for making my cheesecake. But um, that's, that's the, the lazy person's way of doing it. Um, we have a, a, a restaurant about three blocks down the street here in Milwaukee uh, that, that uses a lot of local produce from local farms. But I believe almost every week since we opened, at least until pan the pandemic started, he bought Clark from us and made something different almost every week out of it. So it was going into Crab Rangoon, it was going on pizzas, it was going into lasagna, um, it was going into soups. And uh, it's, it's really the the beauty of the um, of Clark that we can make a garlic and dill flavored quark and we can make a, um, a, a um, maple syrup maple syrup quark yeah we've done, we've done a brandy old fashion flavor we've done tomato basil the brandy um, i have a quick brandy question is another totally milwaukee thing so. yeah <laughs> um what's the name of that restaurant so i can go to it great <laughs> um also, we have a question from Rob Lawrence. Um, he'd like to know, um, he says that cork is difficult to find on the West Coast, as is brick style cheese. And I th think that he'd like you to comment on that. Perhaps tell him where he can get it on the West Coast. Yeah, we're going to kind of close things out with some ideas about distribution. And I see that there are a couple of distributors um, who are on this call. and so. So with a little luck, um, maybe one of them will be interested in, in helping respond to that. Um, we, do, we do ship all over the country, but um, shipping has been traumatic this year. Um, and, and, if, and as we get into warmer weather and trying to get into the LA market in particular, it's probably not gonna be the best solution. Um, so, um, one benefit is it, it does freeze very well. Um, yeah, so, so sometimes we can freeze the quark before it leaves here and get it in packaging with a lot of, with a lot of ice and get it pretty much anywhere. Mm -hmm. We sell it in bulk bags as well as in um, half pound tubs. What, what, what was the cheese that the, the cheese, cheese be key? BQ cheese was inspired by, again. Do you remember? Qualho? Qualho. Qualho. I think it's C U A L H O or something like that. Okay. And they someone wants to know if that's a cheese head behind you. Yes, yes. of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Formation, the uh, company that makes them is right down the street. Very nice. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we tried for a while to have class and not have those, but um, it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. People who come in here, they expect to be able to get a cheese head. <laughs> and, and if not, to at least pose with it so that they have a photo of, of them in a cheese head to take home with them after their vacation. Okay, I, I see that we have, um, there's another question that's, but I know that you want to get to your other cheeses before we before we sign off. So, um, but there is a question from Jane um, asking about when you have multiple uh, people making cheese in your facility, who's responsible for the food safety practices and documentation? Um, all of that. So, so the people who, so, so there are two different situations. One will be a situation where our cheese makers work alongside the other cheese maker who is a licensed cheese maker and has you know, in, in, in all those cases, they were licensed cheese makers or in training to become licensed. And um, so, it, so in, those, in those situations, the, the, um, my cheese makers are ultimately responsible. In, but we also do shared facility agreements. Um, so Landmark and Ron, and Ron uh, Penningfeld have their own plant licenses and the, the state charges them additional money and um, does separate inspections on them in, as well as on us. And we, we also, we share our food safety plan with them, but they have to have their own food safety um, plan as well. And, uh, and, and we go through them and make sure they understand our expectations on that. So um, it, it is an important aspect of it. We don't just let anybody come in and, and hang out and play it. It is a playground, but it's not an open playground. And sometimes when people are considering uh, custom makes with us, uh, you know, they'll initially um, have in mind coming and making their own cheese, but when they figure out all the stuff that goes into it, coming up with their own food safety plan and all that, um, a lot of them determined that it would be a better idea to uh, to just pass it off to our cheesemakers. The, the other thing is, um, I, I, I can say that, that we have had cheesemakers who we've tried to work with um, who didn't like our rules and, um, and, and we did not let them keep doing it. So they weren't on the list that I gave you earlier. But not, not, not every experiment is successful. Um, we, can, we can go through the next two cheeses. Um, Montague, um, the Montague is a cheese that um, we, we make this in the Donatello, which is the sheep milk, 100% sheep milk version of, of pretty much the same cheese. And these are cheeses that are, um, there's quite an investment in them because they're they're made in the wheels and then aged on shelves and churned um, for quite a while and but and, and they don't typically hit the market until um, a couple of years after a year and a half maybe after after they're produced sometimes as little as a year um, so the the cheese is um, You know, it has a little bit of the waxiness that you get in a um, sheep milk cheese, but but the uh, cow milk helps to take that lanolin um, flavor and dampen it down a little bit. I'm, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Stephanie again. I'm always interested as to uh, what your inspira what an inspiration is that, dry that creates a, a mixed milk cheese. Is well, it technical or is it, you know? Um, I, I, think, I think sometimes, um, you know, like the Caprico that's coming up and the Montague, that Sometimes the um, characteristic flavors of the other breeds are not as familiar to uh, people in the United States. And so 
um, especially goat milk, but sometimes sheep milk we find um, are, are so unfamiliar to, to people initially that they are not, um, you know, that they just don't accept them as well. But by blending cow milk with them, we end up with sort of a gateway drug. <laughs> yeah. Right. Sneaking I, one past the goalie, as it were. I, I've, 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 always, I've always considered Capricorn to be the, the, gateway, the gateway to goat milk. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, it, ha it certainly, if you are sensitive to goat flavors, um, you, you notice the goat milk flavor in there, but it comes off as sweet and, and fairly dampened down, tamp, tamped down a bit. And so it, it is less, um, it's less off-putting to people who are unfamiliar with it. I've run into probably a dozen people uh, who claim to not like goat milk uh, cheeses who did like the Caprico. Mm -hmm. And it definitely, there, there's a very distinct flavor that does come through in the Caprico. Um, it's certainly uh, different than the cow milk. Well, and then there's definitely a, um, an incentive for us to make mixed milk cheeses because the milk marketing board is run by the cow milk dairy farmers. And, um, and I wouldn't have either of these cheeses on, on the program today if they were the goat milk and sheep milk varieties of these cheeses. So, yeah. mm -hmm. I would also, this is Molly, I would also throw out there that um, both uh, goat and sheep make a very limited volume of milk. So the amount of cheese that you can actually um, you know, get out into the world is a bit limited. Um, but if you put, if you throw cow's milk in the vat, then you can kind of get all those great um, sensory characteristics that you would get from sheep or goat milk well, to a much wider audience for many reasons. <laughs> yeah, it brings the price point down, as Bill said. There's also, and what you said, Molly, is particularly true at the beginning and the end of the season, um, because it, you know, we'll be getting small amounts of, of sheep milk, um, probably, um, maybe it started last week or the week before, um, but the sheep aren't having all lamb yet. Um, so we, so we're getting not enough milk to fill the vat at, yet, at this point from the sheep milk farmer who's supplying us. And it is very helpful to be able to blend that milk and turn it into a mixed milk cheese. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I haven't been able to say my mouth has been so full of Montague this entire time. I just can't stop eating it. It's so good. Um, it also pairs really well with the orange marmalade. Um, I will say that that has got a really nice thing going on right there. So, <clears throat> yum. Mm -hmm. So are there other questions that we should try to deal with since we're kind of down to the last seven minutes or something? Right. Well, there's again, there's another question um, about distributors. So um, regarding your pork in particular, so I think you've got a, you might have a winner there. <laughs> so let me. Um, Somebody asked why you uh, named a Montague after uh, Shakespeare. Oh, in, the, in particular? Um, you know, I think to be specifically, my, why did you name it after Romeo? Looks like uh, you're, playing, you're playing affinity it, for it, house. It, why, why it wasn't Capulet? We also do have a Capulet. Um, it doesn't sell as well. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we can be. Maybe we can come up with some kind of contest between Capulet and Montague to see which one will sell better, and everybody can swear their allegiance to one family or the other. <laughs> Interest, interesting marketing plan I hadn't thought of until now. <laughs> um, so um, I was just going to run through a few of the distributors that I, that I know are carrying our cheeses now, um, or they're set up to be able to carry our cheeses. Um, and that, but so they'll primarily hope, help people in the Midwest and maybe Florida. Um, so, so Rock Cheese Company is in, in Wisconsin is our, is our primary distributor. Um, 
We also, we, we sell quite a bit to Fortune Gourmet, which now is also classic provisions up in the Twin Cities and, um, and in, the Chicago, in the Chicago area. Uh, we, we sell through Co-op Partner Warehouse up in um, the Twin Cities. Um, other, other distributors are Elegant Foods, Out of Madison, uh, Stamper and Cheese People who go both in the Midwest and into Florida. Uh, Get Fresh, which is I think a primarily a Midwestern distributor. Natural Direct, MCT Dairies, which I think handles primarily bulk product for us, maybe export and that kind of thing. Um, Culinary Connection, Nesvigs, Vimar Cheesy, Artisan Specialties, um, Wisconsin Cheese Mart, and um, we're apparently set up to be able to distribute to U.S. foods, but ha haven't had a whole lot of product go that way yet. So that they might they might be a good option for some people though. So I, I think a lot of these distributors, especially the smaller ones, may not have all of the products or any of the products that we tasted today, but all of them are able to get them. And most of them tend to be pretty responsive to customers. We, we have a super nerd question from Kendall who wants to know what the drain pH and now I can't see what the other <laughs> question is. If you want to get into that level of, hold on, let me give you the- uh, I'll take emails. Okay. Let me, let me copy this for you and you can send it to, uh, what is it? So my, I'll, I'll send you this so you can send it to him directly. Yeah, well, my last slide here um, is, is to thank everybody for joining us today. I don't think we're sharing this. Oh, I don't, yeah, I gotta figure out how to slide, share my slides again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, now, so now we're on there. Um, so, the, so this is the contact information. Um, Bob at cedargrovecheese.com, Bo at clockshadowcreamery.com, our phone number, and, and a big thank you for joining us today. And this time has really gone fast. So yeah, it we always goes so fast. <clears throat> um, I just also wanted to bring up a, a, a comment that Carlos made, um, which is that the on the cheese, whatever, the one from the the cheese BQ or whatever one that you did that he thought that that would be something that might go very well in the Boston area because of the large uh, percentage of um, Brazilian, the Brazilian population here, which oh. might be true. Yeah. That's a great lead. I didn't know that was the case. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, it's uh, one, of, one of the fun things about the wide variety of styles that we've made over the years. Um, Every time somebody comes in and works with me in the plant, or every time a chef comes in and asks us to make a basket ricotta or some product like that, we end up learning a lot, not only about that individual variety of cheese, but about cheese making in general and different ways for us to become better cheese makers and, and to cross pollinate between cheese varieties. And so a lot of, a lot of what happens is um, taking lessons from, well, from, from the trip I took to Honduras where I got an opportunity to work alongside um, Honduran cheesemakers making um, some, some of their, making ricotta and making, um, uh, what's the other one? Um, uh, I can't come up with the name of it, but anyway, you know, it's like, like the, those those cheeses are made in a style that's very different than what we're used to, but we've been able to take those tricks that we learned there and bring them back and throw them into some of the other cheeses. One of the things I love the most about cheese is it's everywhere, and it's you know it's really informed by the people that make it and where it comes from, which is one of the things that's so fun. And and the quark is you know in Eastern Europe it's Tavaric and you know they're they're. There are variations on it as well that show up all over the world. So. Mm -hmm. Well, we are um, we're at our, our one hour mark, and um, I can honestly say I can't wait to see you all in person soon enough, I hope. Get your vaccines as soon as they show up. 
And uh, we will see you soon, I hope. Thank you, Bob. You guys were fabulous. And thank you, Bo. And of course, Molly. Well, thank you for having us. And, and, and when you can, stop by. We love, we love sharing what we're doing. So. Awesome. Hey guys, on behalf of Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin, thanks everybody who attended and thanks Bob and Bo for coming to tell us more about what you guys do.